Thanks everyone for attending our fourth installment of Sit Down with Sabin. My name is Dan Croats with uh, Public Affairs. Uh, and Sit Down with Sabin is a weekly conversation in which Sabin Russell, seated here, uh, engages uh, lab staff about their research. It's uh, been a while since we've had our last one. It's about a three week break. And today you'll hear the, the latest thinking on what it takes to get people to consider energy efficiency in their everyday lives. We also certainly want to hear from you. So. Uh, There'll be plenty of time for questions at the end. Please wait for a microphone because we're videoing this and we'll send a microphone to you if you have your hand up during the Q&A portion. Uh, because it has been a little while, I'll reintroduce our moderator, Saban Russell. He joined Berkeley Lab last year after a long career as a Bay Area health and science reporter. This included 22 years at the San Francisco Chronicle, freelance work with the New York Times, and in uh, a fellowship at MIT as a night science journalism fellow. Uh, he's best known uh, for his work covering HIV in the US and Africa. He's also covered a whole range of other topics, including the Columbia space shuttle disaster and the tsunami in Sri Lanka. Today, you can find him both uh, moderating Sit Down with Sabin, Sit Down with Sabin, and as the lead uh, writer and editor in the Creative Services Office, uh, where he can help you on a variety of uh, projects concerning web content and writing. So if you have any uh, projects for him, feel free to uh, get to him after the talk. And without any further ado, I'll now hand the stage over to Sabin for the, the fourth installment. Thanks. Thank you, Dan, and uh, thank all of you for coming. Uh, this is our fourth uh, uh, in a series of, uh, of experiments on uh, a new format uh, for the lab. Uh, I've been here one year, and uh, some of you have heard this spiel before, but some of you are, there's some new faces here as well. So I wanted to tell you briefly uh, why we're doing this. Um, uh, I'm extremely impressed with the diversity of sciences at this lab. Uh, they talk here about uh, how, we, how we explore both the infinite and the infinitesimal. Uh, we, have, uh, we have the uh, nanotechnologists at the molecular foundry, and we have the co cosmologists just down the hall. Uh, we work on uh, high energy physics here, and we also uh, learn how to save energy um, at, um, at uh, energy technologies, um, environmental energy and technologies. And um, today, um, our, our, our presentation is um, going to be a little bit different. Um, uh, we often talk to people who are bench scientists, um, and today we're, we're going to be talking about um, uh, energy conservation almost from a, um, uh, uh, from, from a marketing standpoint, um, uh, looking at the social science of marketing. Um, and and um, I wanted to, um, I, 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 when you think about the, the, the bench work that goes on here, we think about how people are uh, trying to coax uh, a, a few extra watts out of a photovoltaic panel or uh, find a, a new source of, of, of biofuel that will um, help us um, save energy uh, or save, save fossil fuels. Um, here we're, here we're going to be talking about how to coax energy savings from a different source, which is human beings. How do you convince human beings to save energy? And it's actually a very fundamental question and a very important one. It may be more important in the long run than uh, whether we can get a few extra watts out of a photovoltaic panel. And so, um, as I say, we're going to be talking not about uh, physics so much here as, as perhaps behavioral science, um, the science of marketing, and uh, what's sometimes called the dismal science, um, economics. <laughs> but um, we, have, uh, we have here uh, one of the brightest lights uh, at the lab to discuss these issues. Um, her name is Marion Fuller. And she is a principal research associate at EETD. Um, she uh, got her BA at Stanford. Uh, she got uh, kind of a joint uh, master's uh, in energy and environment at Cal at the same time she got her MBA at the Haas School of Business. Um, she did some uh, uh, clean energy work and at, uh, in Philadelphia and, um, and Vermont. Um, and when the DOE uh, needed uh, to pr put together a panel to help cities and towns um, understand some of the finances of, uh, 
get some financial assistance for energy projects during the stimulus program, uh, Marion was on that panel. Um, so I want to welcome uh, Marion Fuller. Let's give her a, a warm welcome to the lab. <laughs> So, Marion, um, we're going to be talking about um, uh, how you basically get people to buy in to uh, energy efficiency. And I thought it would be useful at the start of this to maybe just define our terms. I, I've heard the term comprehensive home energy improvement. I think that seems to be the area where we're going to be focusing on in terms of your research and your findings. So. Tell us a little bit, what exactly, what exactly yeah. is comprehensive home energy improvement? Yeah, so just, just to put it in context, um, you know, we're focused a lot on buildings. Buildings are about 40% of our energy use, 40% of our greenhouse gas emissions. And a lot of the programs we've had to date have been pretty surface level. You might say 1%, 2% of total energy use in an individual building or home. And what we're saying, what the DOE is saying as well, is we need to get to 15% savings, 20% savings, 50, you know, more than that, in, in California, we're talking about net zero energy buildings. Mm -hmm. And so what that looks like in a home is you're looking at all the systems. And for an individual residential home, you'll be um, sealing that home so all the cool air or hot air that you're using electricity or gas produce isn't escaping. So insulation to also increase kind of the, the building shells, um, uh, ability to maintain all that, that heated or cooled air. You're going to be replacing lighting system. You're often going to be making pretty large uh, changes to your heating or air conditioning systems as well, either going to a much more efficient air conditioning unit, let's say, or going from a gas heater to um, a ductless heat pump that's much, much more efficient in terms of electricity that it transfers um, into making that cool air or that hot air. Is, is there any way to sort of quantify, on average, say, for yeah. the country, uh, how much um, energy savings or perhaps dollar savings um, yeah. might be attained by this by this uh, strategy? Yeah. Well, the, in terms of the the programs I work with, we're shooting for a minimum of 15% energy savings in One homes. Five. One five. 15, 15. 15%. Yep. The potential is far greater than that. I think without a lot of problem, a lot about you know, overwhelming amount of investment, people can save easily 30, maybe even up to 40% of their energy use. Mm -hmm. And in climates where you know, it's really cold or really hot or both, the savings, the money savings especially, is even greater than in a more mild climate. What, what would be the kind of dollar range we're talking about? Well, you know, the average bill in the US to a homeowner is about 150, 200 bucks. So if you're talking 15% of that, you can do the math. You know, it's you know, 15 to $50 uh, mm -hmm. a month that we're talking about in savings. And in places, where it's very cold, they use heating oil, all sorts of things. They can be spending, or even air conditioning in the Central Valley. We have people who spend literally thousands of dollars every month for heating large, really inefficient homes. The savings then get even, even more robust. So um, we, we, we're sort of defining the, 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 the solution here. I think that people sometimes use the term low-hanging fruit in terms of some of the easiest things that can be done yeah. uh, for a big benefit in, in energy savings. And yet, the actual performance out there is, is not so good. The, the success has been limited, right? Yeah. I mean, in yeah. a sense, here we're defined, we may have just defined uh, the term there, but here, here we're defining the problem. The problem is, is that this very valuable um, kind of activity that I think everybody in this room understands and, and perhaps even believes in um, hasn't been adopted. Yeah. Uh, is, is, how, how badly are we doing? Well, I mean, Secretary Chu has called energy efficiency the fruit on the ground. Like, you don't even have to reach up and pick it. it. It's, it's there. Hanging. It's on the ground. It's on the ground. And oh. at the same time, when you think about buildings, all the decision makers involved in buildings, and then having to say yes, get the assessment to their building or their home, go through the process of mm -hmm. having the contractors come in and do that work, making the payments for those, in some cases convincing their landlord or the building owner to make those improvements if they're a tenant. Um, it can get very complex, and it has a lot to do with motivation, who's motivated to do what, and less about just simple dollars and cents. If it's about simple dollars and cents, this would have already happened. Mm -hmm. But it's about these transaction costs and these human factors. 
Um, so a lot of the programs that I've looked at have reached less than half a percent of their targeted population in a given year. So if you think about um, needing to drastically reduce greenhouse gas emissions or wanting to reduce pressure on the grid, those sorts of things, we have to get way beyond that to actually make an impact. Mm -hmm. And so I gather that much of your work is in sort of analyzing the factors that might uh, in one way or another influence people to, to uh, uh, consider this more seriously, it, yeah. to increase those numbers. Yep. And although we don't allow PowerPoints at our presentations, um, we do allow props, and I believe that you brought a prop. <laughs> I brought a couple props. Uh, if I can reach Let's them. Let's go with the blue one first. The blue one first. Okay, well, this is a report. Uh, it's uh, Driving Demand for Home Energy Improvements, a very exciting 130-page read. Um, and available free on the web. Available free on the web at drivingdemand.lbl.gov, super easy to remember. And we also have like two-page handouts that you can just like skim that will give you the key points. And so part of what we did this with the report is try to make it a lot more accessible to as many audiences as possible. Mm -hmm. There's a 30-minute video you can watch and hear me talk about this work. We've had almost 400,000 people download this report since last September. So it's gotten that, a that lot of... That is more of people than have downloaded Sit Down with Saban. <laughs> <laughs> But with this report, what we're, we really tried to do is uh, look at what have we learned from past programs, um, both in terms of the penetration rates, the number of people we've gotten to participate in programs, uh, but also what are the creative things that people are doing to get the attention of homeowners, the decision makers, um, who need to say yes, need to sign on the dotted line, need to make some personal investment for us to be able to get to the type of savings levels that I've mentioned already. Well, I, I gather that the, the, the core of this report is that um, you did a number of case studies. Mm -hmm. And these are, are case studies that, um, uh, of programs that took place over the last 30 years, and yeah. not just uh, the more recent ones. Yeah. Um, uh, we, I think we'll, we'll want to talk um, specifics in a little bit. But um, what, are, what are some of the, the, the take home messages yeah. um, you know, uh, in terms of, uh, of, of what works and what does not work? Are, are there a couple yeah. of like, key, key findings that yeah. um, may, may even be counterintuitive? Yep, um, I think the top two that we saw again and again and again is number one, you have to engage trusted messengers to talk to the people you're trying to reach. So historically, a lot of programs have come at it as the local government, as the utility, and said, hey, I have a new message for you. In addition to paying your energy bill, I also now want you to do all these other things for us that's going to help the world, help you, et cetera. And it was a messenger that wasn't reaching the audience. Um, so you really have to use groups, individuals, nonprofits, schools, et cetera, that those folks already trust, already relate to, are already listening to in various formats, as opposed to coming in totally new, totally fresh, and asking someone to do something. Um, if you think about all the messages we get every day to buy stuff, to change behavior in various ways, you can see like the budgets that we have for efficiency just do not compare to the budgets that Procter & Gamble and Coca-Cola and other, and other large companies have to influence us, to get us to pay attention. And so it really takes some personal connections, um, a trusted messenger to get people to actually take action. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, th I think I've, I've heard you speak about um, so, sort of common myths Mm -hmm. that, that people have about how you how you persuade people yep. um, to to uh, buy into energy. What, what are what are what are some of those myths? And yeah, I, one of one of my secret advices is I like this show called Myth Busters. <laughs> and, uh, so let's let's uh, bust a few myths here. Yeah. So the, so the, the two myths that I hear all the time, especially from policymakers who've been told this is a low hanging fruit for years and years, is one that if people have access to information, they'll behave differently. And in the social science literature, behavioral psychology, this again and again, just because you believe something hypothetically doesn't mean you're going to spend $5,000, have a contractor come in your home, do a bunch of work you don't yet understand. So that's a big one. It's not just saying, oh, this is going to save you money, and then hordes will kind of flock to do this work. The second one is that capital is the problem, that because um, it costs you know, more than a few bucks, you, know, you might need to spend 5000 bucks, let's say. A lot of policymakers are saying all we need is financing. If you just give people access to capital, they'll be able to do this work. They'll do the calculation in their head, cash flow positive, return on investment is great, et cetera, et cetera. Turns out that's not the way people think. And most people don't want loans for things they don't yet want, right? So if you want a car, a loan to buy that car is great. But if you don't yet want insulation, a loan is not going to be what drives you 
to get that installation in your house. You have to want it first, and then financing just offers a way to make that possible for you. So those are the two big ones that we see a lot. I, I guess I've heard advertising described as, as sort of the art of uh, persuading people to want something that they don't need. Um, <laughs> You know, here we're trying to persuade people what, that, that they need something they don't really want. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, is is there um, are there? Let, let's let's talk a little bit about about your your analysis of, of some some projects that took place in the field, mm -hmm. um, where. Because what what you're describing to me sounds like almost an insoluble problem. <laughs> Fortunately, <laughs> you, not. You, but <laughs> if you give people information and you you make money available, and that's not going to do the trick. Yeah. Um, what more do you need to sell something that makes as much sense as as, uh, yeah. as saving money on energy? Well, part of it is that um, the way we're selling it is not effective. So if someone's paying, let's say they're paying 200 bucks a month on their electricity bill, on their on their total utility bill. And you say you can save 20%, and they're like, 40 bucks a month, whoopee. You know, like that may not be what is actually enough to get them to make the investment we're talking about. So when you actually talk to contractors in the field who are working with people every day, getting them to actually do this work, what they tell me is that you have to solve a problem they already have. So, you know, for example, one customer, a contractor went to one customer, and they're like, my daughter's bedroom is freezing, and the rest of the house is overheating. And he's, he was able to both solve that problem, sort of the distribution of airflow in the house, and put in a ton of insulation, a much more efficient heating system, and lower their energy bills significantly. So, so that's interesting. You're, you spoke about trusted messengers. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I, sometimes I don't think of contractors as people I particularly trust. Yeah. But, it, but, it, but in, in point of fact, we all deal with them. Um, yeah. We know how hard their work is. And you're saying that the contractors are the, are the people to work through. Huge. So I think, so in terms of, we were talking earlier about the two big lessons. One is trusted messengers, and the other one is contractors. Mm -hmm. And having contractors uh, know how to sell. You know, a lot of the programs I work with have done technical training forever, and they're finally starting to train contractors to talk to people to actually be able to communicate these usually foreign concepts to folks who you know, have a cold bedroom or experiencing drafts or, yeah, they have a really high air conditioning bill in the summer because they live in Sacramento. You know, so actually addressing those problems and being able to um, communicate about what's going on in their homes in a way that do is not alienating, makes sense, um, is actually compelling. So, so you're talking about this, this sell or making the sale almost, it seems to me, in terms of very detailed, down-to-earth, real-life uh, scenarios as opposed to yeah. um, maybe preaching at somebody that you should have ought to save energy yep. or that, um, you know, that we have some money available yep. or, you know, you can do this, this, and this. Yep. Here you're talking about kind of closing the deal at the kitchen table. Yes. That key, key decision point. And I have to say, money on the table helps. So programs around the country, including here, are offering big rebates. You know, mm -hmm. California, you can get up to $4,000 to do this work in your home right now. That helps. That definitely gets people's attention. Yeah. And it makes it easier for the contractor to make that deal. They could say things like, well, you know, this rebate is only going to last for the next year. Make, it, make a move now. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of the contractor in the home, making that sale at the kitchen table, that is where the decision point um, happens. And if they're able to you know, use an infrared camera where they can actually see where the panel of insulation is missing in their wall, or can see the cracks around their windows, or whatever other leakage that they have in their house, they can actually visualize that. That helps. So there are some tools. There, there are, are some, some gimmicks. tools. Yep. Gimmicks, not gi gadgets. <laughs> gadgets. Gadgets, not gimmicks. Yes. Which reminds me, yeah. you brought for show and tell something else. Yeah, this is a really simple tool. It's called a kilowatt. Um, all you do is plug this into one of your outlets. You plug whatever device uh, you want into it. So we, for example, use this with a refrigerator. We had a really old refrigerator. We had no idea how old or how inefficient it was. We could plug that in, and we can find both the instantaneous power that was using and over time, you know, what, what its cycles were. So over 24 hours, we can find out how many kilowatt hours it was using. And it's called kill a watt. Kill a watt. Get it? Yep. Yeah. So, th so this is, now is this a tool that a contractor would bring into a bring into a home, or would somebody buy this and feed this information to a contractor? Both, both. both. Okay. You know, a lot of energy nerds like myself like these, and they're like, "Oh, how much does this use? How much does this use?" Um, I don't, I don't see this as becoming a mass market device. How much will that set me back? You know, ten bucks. I don't. Ten it's bucks it's at home. cheap. I can't. Okay. I don't even know. Okay. But yeah, it was, it's pretty cheap. 
Um, and they have much more sophisticated devices now. You can have a little clamp just on your main meter and watch your energy use over time. Um, there's other devices now where you can plug it into multiple sockets and measure different zones of your house. Mm -hmm. So you can actually see where you're wasting energy. Well, you know, we hear a little bit uh, in California about the smart meter program mm -hmm. um, at, at PG&E. Yeah. Um, does that program, in fact, provide the kind of information that could be useful to either the contractor or, mm -hmm. the, or the consumer at home? Yeah, it definitely provides more detailed information to the utility about where energy is being used. And in a number of pilots that actually PG&E and, and a few others are doing, it, they actually use it to compare your energy use versus others in your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So that's actually getting at uh, behavioral insight of using social norms to influence behavior. So they give you a bill and you see yourself, you see your neighbor, your average neighbor energy use, and you see like the more efficient neighbor. And ideally, you're more than those, right? So, so that you're like, oh my gosh, I'm really, you know, I'm not normal. I need to reduce my energy use. And they usually then include a bunch of ways that you might so, do so that. So it makes it a little less abstract if you actually have some data yes. um, to, to indicate that you, you really are getting somewhere. I mean, I guess it's sort of like driving your Prius yep. and looking at the dashboard and seeing that you're, um, yeah. you're running on electricity right now. Yeah, and oh. getting that feedback when you actually make improvements too is really important for maintaining interest. So if, if I'm not mistaken, some of the case studies that are outlined in, in this very book, <laughs> book. A, available free <laughs> on the web, um, t talk about comp outright competitions. Yeah. Uh, they, they're in Boston, there's a, there's a smackdown. Yeah, the energy smackdown. Sma smackdown. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, at, how, how'd that work? That had um, households competing against each other in multiple challenges. They both had an overall energy use, sort of, they, they were measuring those homes' energy use, about 100 households. Um, how they, how they you know, competed over time, over about a one year, one year period. But they also had individual challenges. They actually went to one person's house in each of the three teams that were competing and did insulation and air sealing. Within a three hour period, they had to try to reduce all the air filtration that was leaving that house um, and competed against each other to do that actually competing in speed of So you had three hours, as much air leakage as you could stop in that three hours, whoever did the best job won, sort of thing, yeah. And, and it, now, was that program considered successful? I think so. Um, it, you know, that one was particularly expensive to run just because of the kind of hand-holding all those households had to do. Um, but there are other programs that have more kind of general, uh, broader competitions, let's say between towns. And so the other example of that in the report is one in Kansas where literally they had towns in Kansas competing against each other for total energy use changes. Kansas does not strike me offhand as a state that, um, you know, we're, we're energy efficiency. I mean, energy efficiency sounds vaguely left wing. And, and I, <laughs> well, it just... turns out it can appeal to all audiences. So... And it also depends on how you message it, right? So in Kansas, they weren't saying you're going to save the earth, be green, you know, join Obama in the campaign to reduce energy use. <laughs> they were saying your town is competing against that town over there, and we want to make sure that we're better than them <laughs> in a friendly way. And they also created these um, steering committees of local leaders, you know, the folks in the town who everyone respected, the guy who owned the radio station, the, per the woman who was on the school board, uh, the person who had all the like really you know, most popular restaurants in town. Those guys were actually the face of the program. And, and these are your trusted messengers? These are the trusted the messengers. trusted messengers, okay. Yeah, yep. and so they decided, you know, there was money from the outside coming in through a local nonprofit in Kansas, uh -huh. and they, um, they on the ground, they've got to decide how would it be most effective to use this money. Was it a street fair? Was it a party at the local restaurant? You know, what are the different ways? Um, there's two towns that had rival football teams. You know, they had a particularly great you know, rivalry going on. And they were able to get people's attention because of the competition. Um, they also had messages around just being, you know, sensible. Like, you're, you need to save energy. We, there's no reason for us to waste resources. Like, it's just not a practical, sensible thing to do. And there's lots of other reasons besides climate change, besides environment, to, to do efficiency work. Um, so that's been, that's been a really successful program. And actually, we have, um, an, uh, the, the lab is actually hosting Nancy Jackson, who is one of the leaders of that uh, effort in Kansas on October 3rd um, at the Berkeley Rep. So if you're interested in that program and hearing more about their experiences on the town, how they were able to communicate what was important about that program, get people engaged. Is this the, the science and the theater program? That's right. Excellent. Yep. October 3rd. October 3rd. Don't miss it. Yeah. And, and um, so 
So I, I'm, I'm curious though, uh, this is such an interesting example, Kansas, be, be, were these um, super rural communities or were they um, some of the urban areas of, of Kansas? It was, it was towns, so it wasn't the largest uh -huh. metro areas in Kansas, so smaller towns in Kansas. Uh -huh. yep. and, uh, were there any, is there any way to quantify um, any, uh, are there results in yet, or yeah. partial results, how they Actually, do? I don't know the, I mean, they definitely saved energy. I think it was around a 5% savings, but my memory is failing me. One interesting thing is that because they did it while the recession was in progress, most places in the U.S., or many places in the U.S., reduced their energy use just because of economic activity being down. And so what they did is they had one kind of control town and one competition town, and they were similar in size, similar in energy mm -hmm. use, and they looked at what that control town's energy use did in the last year compared to the competition town and subtracted those. So anything related to the recession, to just mm -hmm. uh, the conditions of, of that last year, even weather has a big impact, they tried to get rid of that and really isolate what was due to the competition. Uh -huh. I mean, are, are there any numbers to toss around? like? Um, milliwatts or, or <laughs> kilowatts? Uh, Actually, I don't remember the exact numbers. It was, I think it was around 5% total energy use. Okay. And they got you know, thousands of new lighting fixtures installed, a bunch of upgrades done. So, um, so this is considered sort of a success? Yeah, definitely, yeah. definitely. Well, you know, I'm, I'm a former newspaper guy, you know, kind of negative, uh, so I, mm. I can't help but asking, uh, <laughs> do, any, any of these programs not work very well? I mean, we, know, we sort of know what works. Do we, did we find any programs that maybe were, were less than successful? There's a lot of programs that are less than <laughs> successful, at least less than I'd like to see them uh -huh, be. Uh -huh. um, what, what sort of mistakes or what, what are the lessons learned? You know, a lot of what we focused on, uh, just because of interest by, the, by DOE and others, is financing mm -hmm. programs. Mm -hmm. So programs um, that just offer a loan product, like I was saying earlier, is not enough to actually motivate people. And so there's, there's literally, like if you look in the database they have online for this, there's like 150 energy efficiency loan programs out there tiny, tiny participation rates for most of them. Really? And that's because they just offer the product, they maybe include it in your utility bill insert, and they expect magic to happen, and it just doesn't. Huh. It takes much more than that to motivate people. I, I, you, you've mentioned um, in conversations I've had with you how important language is in, yeah. in communicating things like this, and one of the things that intrigued me is you, you were talking about how simple terms like uh, an energy audit, which is what I what I would think of when a contractor comes in, does some tests, see, see uh, that that's not a good term. Uh, yeah. And that um, even the term retrofit, uh, mm -hmm. uh, what, what's wrong with those terms and, and uh, what would you prefer and is there any science behind that or is this yeah. just, just your feeling you don't like those words? Yeah, well, it is, it is a fuzzy science always in terms <laughs> of language and what works and who's motivated by what. Mm -hmm. But I think we do know that people have mental frames that have meaning or, or, or in some cases not, that words are attached to these frames that have a meaning. Mm -hmm. um, and that as much as possible, you don't want to have to create new words, new language, new meaning for people. You want to tap into something that they already understand, they relate it to something positive, they relate it to the types of things that you want them to associate it with. So when we talk about the word audit, um, you know, maybe in this room everyone's like an audit, yeah, an energy audit, I'm really up for that, that sounds exciting. Most people think like IRS, I would not pay for that <laughs> in a million years, and it just doesn't resonate. What are they gonna it, find it, out? It doesn't, right? either it doesn't, it doesn't mean much or it doesn't have a positive meaning. Uh -huh. um, same thing with retrofit, in general, you know, we actually had a, a behavioral scientist like look at all the words that we're using through DOE programs and he was like, Retrofit, what does that even mean? It just doesn't have any attachment, or it's like backwards and the future sort of retro. And so we need to use language that has some meaning for people. So I think, uh, not backed up by mm -hmm. extensive analysis or research, because it's very hard to do that type of research, that using something like home energy improvements, where you're connecting to making improvements to your home, something that people are already familiar with, is good. Home energy improvements, home energy upgrades. Um, folks are using things instead of audit, saying an assessment, home assessment, home checkup. Um, I like the idea of thinking about efficiency in terms of the miles per gallon for your home. People are already tuned into that for cars. So it taps into a frame that already makes sense to them that's very relevant. Okay, we buy more efficient cars now, gas is expensive. Of course it makes sense to have a more efficient home. So is there, is there, is there any work on a metric for a more efficient home? There is actually some really interesting work right now that's trying to label and be able to compare homes to one another. So in Europe and Australia, they actually already have multiple, they, they have rate, labeling systems and many homes are actually required to get a label so that when you buy a home, you actually know how does it compare, um, you, know, you know, what am I buying? Because you don't have the utility bills in most cases in well, advance. Well, 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 my icebox 
has an Energy Star label. Yep. Energy Star developed it. Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Yeah, and that is one of the most well-recognized brands in efficiency. It's uh -huh. super successful. Is there any way to, to, to uh, create an energy star rating for a house, for instance? So what we're doing right now is the DOE is piloting something called a, the, the home energy score. And it has you know, multiple bars, one through 10, you know, where your home falls on that, and compares you to everyone else in the country and kind of you to what your home could be based on the metrics they collect on that home. And we're trying that out right now. And actually, uh -huh. folks at the lab have been really involved in that pilot and really involved in the back end um, assessment of how you actually get to that score, what information you need to put in to come to, to, to that ultimate score. You, you said something um, I think I, I saw on a, on a video of one of your presentations. Yeah, you're on the, on the lecture circuit a lot, it seems. Um, talking about um, uh, losses and, and gains, and mm. people re, re, respond differently to that. I mean, yeah. what, 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 explain that a little bit. Yeah, so this is one of the sort of insights from behavioral science that we think is really important when talking to people about improvements in their home. Um, so people tend to be more sensitive to losses than to gains. And so a specific example is they're more sensitive to losing $5,000 to pay for this upgrade than they are to the 50 bucks a month that they're gonna gain, supposedly, in energy savings. Well, maybe they're just good at math. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, a lot of times with efficiency, it actually pencils out quite well. It does. But we have a hard time, um, you know, aggregating benefits in the future and really fully valuing them, you know, in dollars today. It's just, it's something that's hard for our brains to do. And most people are not taking out their pen and paper. Mm -hmm. um, and we're used to buying services, you know, a little bit at a time. So, for example, um, you know, if you had to pay for all your cell phone minutes for the next... 10 years today, that's gonna to be pretty painful as opposed to spending like 200 bucks a month or the insane rates that we had to pay for cell phones. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about paying for all of our savings for the next 10 years for a house in one lump sum, way less appealing than paying a little bit at a time, right? And that's part of the reason that financing is, is gonna be of interest once people wanna do these improvements. Let's go, let's go back to some of your um some of the case studies that you talked about. Um, there was one in Massachusetts that kind of interested me because I think the, the participation level there was, was mind-blowing. You were talking about getting 5% you know, participation yeah. sometimes. And, and if I'm not mistaken, this was close to 70%. Yep. Um, what, what were they doing right? Well, there's a number of programs that have gotten kind of above 50%, and it's usually a combination of things. So in that case, um, really great door-to-door, -door, like your neighbors are engaged, the community leaders are engaged, it's everywhere, you can't miss it, so it, it kind of hits people in the face. Um, and that becomes a social norming thing. You know, some of the programs I work with, every single home that they do upgrades to, they put a sign in the front, and it's like, Gee, what, you know, we participated, why didn't you? It's kind of the message on most of them. Uh -huh. So that sort of social Guilt. norming piece. Guilt. Guilt. Guilt, making you feel like you're not part of the uh -huh. group. Uh, we, that makes us uncomfortable. Um, they also, in many cases, provided really large subsidies. Uh -huh. So programs that pay for all or a big chunk of the cost are more successful. Like, that's not a surprise, but it's actually in combination with, with kind of these behavioral-based techniques that you get the highest participation rates. Now, now what, one of the things that struck me about that was that this particular community in Massachusetts was kind of an upscale community. Mm -hmm. it was a, it, I don't know, it might have even been a wealthy community. Mm -hmm. and, and that's something that I'm, I kind of wrestle with on energy yeah. efficiency is, is energy efficiency a, a little bit of a, of a luxury item? Yeah. Uh, not so much a luxury item, but something for people who, for instance, can afford a Prius. Not everybody mm -hmm. can afford a Prius. Yeah. Um, uh, how, do, it, is energy efficiency only going to work um, for people who, who have the bucks to um, uh, assuage their guilt? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think this is really problematic, actually. So in the, in the US, we have programs that address the bottom third in terms of income um, with free programs. And those programs were boosted by Recovery Act dollars, but are nowhere near large enough to actually meet the meet, need of the, the kind of the bottom third. And we're talking about folks with household incomes less than $30,000 a year, right? So a $5,000 improvement is kind of insane in that, in that context. Um, and then you have all the, you know, above, you know, above $30,000 a year household, they are able to participate in these market rate programs that we're doing a lot of work on. And what we're seeing is that most of the folks who are participating, especially in the financing programs, have really high credit ratings. So while income is not directly correlated to credit, there's certainly a lot of, there's certainly some relationship there. Um, and so our assumption, and we've kind of 
talked to a lot of program managers now. We know that it's, it is wealthier people that tend to be participating more. They mm -hmm. also tend to be bigger energy hogs, so they actually have greater savings in some cases. Um, however, we're doing research right now in my group looking at moderate income families. So, you know, $30,000 to $60,000 a year. What do, the, you know, what do these folks look like? Turns out they mostly live in single family homes. They mostly own their own home. In the, in the past, they've done a ton of home improvements. You know, about a third, they're about a third of the, the whole population, about a, a third of the home improvements have been made in those buildings. So they're active participates, participants in doing home improvements. But a lot of that has been based on borrowing you know, home equity lines because they had value left in their home. And what we're seeing now is those folks have less equity, way less access to credit, and also much higher um, financial instability. So they're wanting to save more. They're less willing to make these investments. So we're doing research right now looking at how do you offer additional support to these moderate income families to make sure that they are guaranteed savings to some degree, that they have more access to credit, um, that they, they have different ways. Maybe you offer them some additional incentives. You pay for half of the project costs and then finance the rest. So we're looking at ways right now of how we might better able to meet that, that middle income market. Because they do use a ton of energy, they could definitely benefit from those savings, mm -hmm. and they aren't getting access probably as much as these other groups. Before we open it up to the floor uh, for questions, so think about your questions. Um, I, I, another thing I was wondering about is, you know, here we are in California where it's uh, 60 degrees outside and you flip on the news and half the country's baking over 100 degrees. <laughs> uh, and, and we like to um, take a certain amount of pride in the fact that we're leading the, the world in some ways in energy efficiency in California. Is that because our, our, um, our energy policies are, are better, or is it just simply that you know, we have the gift of this incredible climate, and, mm. and we don't face the kinds of, of um, energy issues that other places do, that perhaps their problems are more real than ours? Yeah. So our climate actually hurts us more than helps us. Ah. We use far less energy, in, in most cases, especially in the Bay Area with a pretty moderate climate mm -hmm. than a lot of other places. If you go, you know, certainly Central Valley has a lot of cooling issues, <laughs> and but as you get up into the, the you know, northern parts of the country or the southern parts of the country, they have, you know, heating issues, cooling issues, heating and cooling issues in many places where they have hot summers and cold winters, way higher potential for savings in so, those zones. So we so actually have more, less potential for savings. So there's more to be gained in these places that yeah. are having, having a rough time with it. With, yes. with, uh, with their climate. Yeah, and we also have invested consistently in efficiency. So, and we have higher electricity prices, which is another benefit to efficiency programs here. It look, the dollars do pencil out better here than let's say in the Pacific Northwest where they have really cheap hydropower or in other parts of the country where they have really cheap coal power. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, I, I would like to, to um, open it up to the floor. We'll, we'll, I'll, I'll still be asking some questions down here, down here but we have folks with, um, with, with microphones, um, and if you just raise your hand, um, we'll, uh, we'll call you out, and, and we'd love to hear your questions. As you know, uh, most utilities offer uh, pro, uh, rate programs to residences that are tier-based, mm -hmm. and um, most uh, rate payers don't really understand those too well, and, um, and there's, you know, many academics and others think that dynamic pricing that actually uh, better reflects the actual cost of production of mm. electricity uh, would be a better way for, for people to actually change their behavior based on the actual cost of, of electricity as, as it changes in the yeah. hot summer afternoons, for example, it might be more expensive. Yep. Uh, yet, in general, there's been resistance to that by many consumer groups. Yep. So, so uh, I, I'd like you to comment on your thoughts on dynamic pricing. Yeah, so dynamic pricing has a lot of potential for sure, and there's actually folks in the lab doing research on it right now with the DOE. There's actually a report that came out, I think it was yesterday, with the utility in Texas that showed that folks significantly reduced their energy use as a result of dynamic pricing. And part of it was just knowing when they're using energy. Um, the problem is that you have to like constantly have people be aware of it, unless you have appliances that are smart appliances and somehow know to turn off at certain hours and turn on at certain hours, which, um, which can work really well, but we haven't figured all that out yet. Um, you know, so just so everyone knows, you know, if you use energy between like two o'clock and six o'clock, um, it's way more expensive for the utility to procure it because there's so much more demand in those hours. So they're turning on really expensive sort of peak generating units. 
Um, it would be great, you know, be great financially and also environmentally to avoid that. And so anything we can do to have people better understand energy use, I think is great. However, I think that especially individual homeowners' attention spans are pretty small. And my guess is that you might have some interest at first, and maybe you'll develop some habits that are maintained. But to get people to pay attention super closely um, over a longer period of time might be difficult. But it may start to be a norm, like, OK, I'm just not going to turn anything on until 6 PM, because I know that that's when the peak happens. In terms of the tiers that we have now in California, where as you use more, it costs more per, per unit, um, it definitely makes efficiency projects look better. It definitely makes solar projects look better. A lot of the solar installers that I've talked to, it's like that's where they, they, they sell to the people who are playing, paying 20, 30 cents a kilowatt hour instead of 12 on the low end, because they're up in these higher energy uses. So it certainly is effective for selling things to the right people, but it's not something that people already know about. Yeah. Another question uh, in the back of the room. Hi. Um, so I know that you're talking about people having to um, invest all this capital initially uh, to improve energy efficiency in their homes. And I know that one incentive that's often used is um, mentioning to people that there will be a break-even point mm -hmm. in the future. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering if you could give us a rough estimate. If you wanted to invest to achieve yeah. that 15% yep. reduction, what would the break-even time be versus like, yep. if you wanted to achieve a 50% reduction? Oh, that's harder. 50% is harder. But um, I can give you a sense. So in this climate zone, I actually just had a home energy assessment. And we did a simple calculation. It's going to be about 10 and a half years before we break even. And that's the after the incentives that we're getting cost. We're really low energy users relative um, for the area. Um, in other places where um, electricity is either more expensive or they're much higher energy users, so like 30% of a $1,000 bill is going to be way different than saving 30% on a $200 bill. Um, in those places, you could, you know, I think three to 10 years for residential home energy is probably reasonable to expect. And, on the, and just depending on your energy use, the cost of your energy, and the leakiness of your home, um, you're going to be on the lower end if those things are in your favor. What a question, uh, right here. Hey, Marion. Um, I have two questions. So the first is I wonder if you could speak to uh, the role you see mobile technology and also social media playing in this. Mm. I've heard of a number of projects that are you know, looking at developing iPhone apps that are games or mm -hmm. push notifications, things like that. And then the other one is um, what you think the role or the effectiveness of educational out outreach through younger generations mm. might be uh, mm. in this, and whether there's any, I don't know if there's any data or on the effectiveness of that in changing behavior. So yeah. educating people that are going to be homeowners in 10, 15 years, and also getting to their parents through children. Yep, great questions. And I don't think we have any conclusions on those questions yet, but I do know that many of the successful programs are using various forms of social media. They might have, you know, so they, you know, every program I work with now has a Facebook page, but some of them actually send out like regular updates. Some, there's actually a program that I've been looking at that um, has you compete against other customers in utility area for doing different tasks, different, so you, you get points for different activities. And I think that will appeal to a certain segment of the population. I've yet to see a social media technology like take off and be able to point to it in any sort of mass way, but I think especially for certain parts of the population that will be appealing. Um, on the educating the younger generation, we don't have great data yet, but a lot of folks are looking at the recycling campaigns in the last 20 years, and that did have a very significant impact. They were able to look at that over time. Um, and so a number of places now, all over the country really, and the EPA and DOE are also supporting this, um, looking at curriculum where it's making uh, energy efficiency and and all sorts of sort of sustainable, you know, reducing water use, reducing uh, garbage uh, production, uh, more easy, and having folks, having kids, encourage their parents to actually do new behaviors. Uh, there's one program in Marin where they actually have a little coupon book, and for every activity that they get their parents to do, they get to have a coupon, and it adds up to some prize they get, and it goes along with a kind of fun curriculum that's in the classroom. Uh, there's a program in Boulder where they actually bring in cartoon characters that, you know, are count, what is it? <laughs> anyway, there's like superhero, basically, characters that have songs and other things that get younger kids, you know, in elementary school to think about these things, be engaged, and even do, you know, audit, you know, audits, assessments of their own house to figure out where the savings are. 
So, and another example actually is in terms of trusted messengers, um, Alameda County is actually trying out a program where schools, um, if the more parents they get in their schools to participate, they can actually get paid per parent, and that goes into a general school fund. And then there's a prize at the end of the year where this where for each parent that they get goes into a lottery and they can win $10,000 that will pay for books and other sort of supplies that that school needs. So they're trying to see is, is, a, is, is schools and through kids a good way to reach parents. And I, th I think it, it seems to be, but there's not any great data on that yet. Marin, um, in a lot of marketing um, research that I'm aware of, there's a term that comes up a lot in t when you're trying to bring out something new, which is, I think it's called early adopter. Mm. Um, you talk about needing to know who your target audience is. Yeah. Uh, are early adopter? Who are the early adopters, and are they right now the target audience for something that is still kind of a relatively uh, new concept in this country, even even mm -hmm. though it's been around for a long time, it, clearly with a relatively low rate of of, of acceptance. Um, yeah. it, it has that sort of new quality to it. Yeah. I think targeting uh, the, the small percentage of the population, it's, people usually say it's like 5 to 15 percent that are willing to go first, that are willing to innovate, to try new things. It makes a lot of sense because you need, you need examples, you need case studies, you need people to point to to say this is normal, lots of folks are doing it, lots of folks have benefited to get the other 85 percent of folks who don't want to try things that are new, who want to feel like they're just part going with the flow as trends change and not the kind of trendsetters. Does does that do early adopters uh, uh, cluster at one end of the income spectrum, or do you find people who are maybe lower income, they don't have the resources, but they have the the desire to try out new yeah. things? That, do it, it varies with each technology and with each region. Mm -hmm. um, there was some work on this done in Southern California that found that their target audience, at least one of them, was homes with uh, multiple, like five people or more, so uh -huh. families with children. Um, women, um, Latino families, um, folks with couples that were over 40 years of age. So th they found like certain segments that seem to be more interested, more willing to try new things. Some more questions out there. Um, Can you say again how to access that LBL report? Yeah, it's drivingdemand.lbl.gov. And another website you guys might want to know about is Energy Upgrade California, which if you want to do an upgrade to your home, has information about rebates and contractors to contact. Some more questions out there? I think we need to turn the uh, mic on. Hello? Hi. There you go. Um, so two questions. The first one is a little smaller. It's if we have about half the people in this country who own houses or something like that, but the other half rent. So what's really being done to help people who are renting? Yeah. And as sort of a tie into that question, what additional problems are there in more urban settings to achieving efficiency than in more suburban and rural areas? Yeah, really good question. So this question about renters and split incentives, especially if you know, the, the building owner is going to pay for the improvements, but the person renting is actually paying the utility bill. Huge issue. So it's around, it depends. In urban areas, way greater concentration of multifamily units. A lot of those are renters, right? So that's it. That's the huge split. Um, it's a really, really hard problem, you know, and not one that we figured out in, in any sort of, I think, satisfying way. One thing is that a lot of low-income folks live in rental units. More low-income folks live in rental units than in any of the other income groups. And so we need to be giving, I think, free and subsidized services to make sure those are just being done. Um, in Boulder, they have an interesting program where it's, it's called their Smart Reg. So they're actually requiring all multifamily buildings to make improvements by 2018. So they've set a deadline. The standard is actually, in terms of what they have to meet, the, the different qualifications, it's actually fairly low. But what they're finding that is that as soon as these building owners go through the program, figure out their rating, um, they're actually making improvements even if they already would have be, been able to pass through the programs. And part of that is they're offering incentives at the same time. The other part of that is that um, uh, those folks are finding out about things they didn't know about in their buildings and are seeing some value in having better, you know, these are th good things that are good for the structure in, in addition to good for their bills. Another example of reaching renters, there's a program, actually another program in Kansas, where they have repayment of improvements on the utility bill. And so in a case where a renter is paying the utility bill, they'd be paying a portion of that. 
Um, and they found in that program that about 15% of their program participants are rental units, and about 15% of the total population of homes are rental units. So they're actually having a good proportion of that population participate. They're really careful to make sure that those um, landlords aren't, you know, replacing granite countertops and getting a higher rental values and then putting it on the bill. They're very careful to make sure it's only certain improvements that they know are gonna save folks energy on their bills. So there's a few interesting things going on around the country, but nothing that kind of broadly addresses that issue of split incentives. Uh, Marian, uh, some of the people in the audience here are um, maybe even high school students or college interns who are thinking about their careers. Mm -hmm. I, I'm always kind of curious when, uh, when I talk to people at the lab, how, how you got to this path, mm -hmm. um, particularly in, in a subject where there, there's a certain amount of idealism infused in the, in mm -hmm. the whole notion of saving energy and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and saving, the, saving the world. Mm -hmm. um, how did you, how did you get, get to this field? Yeah, I mean, after, after college, I actually went, I was working more with small businesses on local economic development mm -hmm. and decided that I wanted to know something in particular, <laughs> so went back to grad school. Um, and for me, energy efficiency actually combines you know, environmental issues, economic development issues. Um, it connects to this whole web of, of infrastructure that's required for both economic development and for providing services to folks. Um, and it's, you know, it's supposedly the low-hanging fruit, but it has all these really interesting facets that are both, you know, there's the financial piece of it, where how do you get capital to this market? How do you get trillions of dollars of money to make massive investments in our building infrastructure, which is aging? Um, and on the other hand, the sort of human side of it, where individuals have to be motivated to make decisions that, you know, are, and these decisions are competing with a ton of other things, and how do you make that appealing? So to me, it's both an intellectual, interesting challenge, and buildings are like 40% of our greenhouse gas emissions and 40% of our energy use. So it's big enough to be exciting. Um, were, were, yeah. you, were you drawn, you, you grew up in Oakland. Um, yeah. were, were you drawn to this, um, you know, as a young girl growing up in Oakland? Did you, did you think that this is a direction you wanted to, to go, or, or was it until you uh, were in college that you started to think in, in the terms of the career path you're on yeah. right now? I mean, growing up, I was interested in environmental issues for sure, um, but not necessarily in efficiency. I hadn't connected the two by a long shot. So it was really through school that I learned about those connections. We have us uh, way in the back in, in the orange shirt or yeah, red hi. shirt. Um, with um, the switch towards single issue retrofit measures, you know, talking to somebody about a drafty bedroom or, or a leaky window or something like that, and then mm -hmm. improving that, then that, that brings to my mind, the issue of rebound effects, and, mm -hmm. and those are particularly problems in, in residential efficiency measures, and, and it seems like they might even be more so a problem if you're selling uh, an efficiency retrofit based upon a single issue. Can you, mm -hmm. can you speak to that and a little bit of the research that you've seen? Yeah, there's, yeah there's a lot of conflicting research on this, um, and certainly a lot of opinion out there about re rebound effect. In fact, many folks at the lab have been involved in those discussions. Um, the, the basic idea is that if people, you know, are able to get energy more cheaply because it takes you know, less money to heat the room, maybe they'll turn the thermostat up. Maybe they'll do other things that will use more energy. Um, you know, I think that this is a particularly interesting issue in when you're working with lower income households where a lot of them actually have been very uncomfortable and literally have not turned their furnace on because it just, they know it goes right outside. And so you see rebound effect, particularly in that market, I think for really good reasons, right? You're, you're helping people not be really, really cold and uncomfortable or really, really hot and uncomfortable who couldn't afford it before because they were just losing the energy as they, when they turned it on. Um, in general, a lot of programs are focused on um, not just provide, a well-trained contractor that kind of has this whole home solution, they're doing insulation, air sealing, HVAC upgrades, this whole solution, they're also talking to folks about energy use more broadly. Um, and even though saving energy is not people's, I don't think it's their number one driver, it's always part of it. And so really good contractors will connect the dots for folks. And we can't control how much energy people use. If they want to be way hotter or way colder or whatever, we can't control that. But at least with physical improvements to their house, they can get to whatever level they're getting, trying to get to much more cheaply and with less energy use. Um, and with a little bit of education about not wasting energy through vampire loads, through lighting, through all the other things that um, are going on in a house, it seems in most cases, on average, we are saving energy rather than rebound effect chewing up too much of that savings. We have time for just a, a few more questions. Um, 
right, right there. I had, a, I had a question about consumption. Um, our identity is in large part defined as a consumer. We call ourselves consumers. Mm. We associate increased consumption with well-being and happiness. Mm -hmm. um, marketing was born out of a need to drive wants. Um, so, and then even even in terms of purchasing things, when we want to spend our money, we want things that people can see mm -hmm. that give us social esteem. Yeah. Um, and even if you're buying photovoltaics or, or Priuses, those give esteem. Um, but these and upgrades, they're not visible. Yep. So is that an inherent impediment to marketing something? Because you're marketing the absence of consumption. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's the age old problem of efficiency. You have nothing to show, <laughs> right? It's like we're using less of something that you can't see. <laughs> it's a huge problem, and it's one of the reasons things like solar and Priuses and things like that that are bought as status symbols in many cases do well, even though the e economics might not work out. Um, there are a lot of people trying to think through this problem. You know, how do you make it more visible? You know, some some programs, they, as I mentioned, they have these yard signs. Others are like a little golden seal that you could put on your door. Others, you know, my rating, if you can rate your house, my rating is a 10 and yours is only a 6, you know, sort of thing. So it starts to become more of a social, social norm to think in those terms. Um, I also think that it just needs to be a practical decision that everyone makes. Like, it can't be... I don't know that efficiency is ever going to be like the shining star, look at the cool new thing I did. I, I'm hoping it becomes like a practical home improvement. Like, yes, I make sure my ducts are not blocked and I change my filter in my, you know, in my furnace and yeah, I have insulation, don't you? You know, I think I, we need to get there as a society. Mar marketing the absence of consumption, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> You're trying to sell the fruit that's not even low hanging, it's on the ground. Yeah. Right? You, you right. Have Who wants the fruit on the ground? It's kind of gross. <laughs> <laughs> um, perhaps one more question. There we go. You, do, you said that uh, buildings are 40%, that means there's 60%. What lessons can transfer to like the transportation sector or mm -hmm. the industrial sectors? Yep, really good question. Um, in terms of the work that we did, I think all, many of the behavioral insights around, uh, you know, we're more sensitive to losses than gains, and we tend to overestimate, you know, that we're, we're above average, we don't like to have multiple decisions, we get confused. There's a lot of behavioral insights in the research we did that are going to be really relevant to, for example, transportation, which is a huge nut to crack. And in California, it's way bigger as a percentage of our greenhouse gas emissions than in many other states. Um, also, a much more difficult nut to crack because of the convenience and you got convenience, you got social, there's all these sort of linked things in terms of transportation, both using public transportation and using other forms of transportation than what we currently use. Really, really difficult. But I think especially in California, that's what we're gonna need to work on and it's gonna take a lot of those behavioral insights and probably a lot else as well to get us to change, change the, the dial on that one. As, uh, as we wrap up here, I, I wanna remind you that um, next week at this very spot, at the same time, um, I'm going to be in conversation with Henrik Schiller, who is a um, vice president for uh, feedstocks at J-Bay. Um, and uh, he's a plant uh, biochemist who will be explaining uh, some of the science of improving <laughs> plants so that they become um, better feedstocks for biofuel. Um, we're out of time, but I certainly, I certainly felt this time went very quickly because um, this is a very interesting topic. We had a, an excellent guest, and I, I would like you all to give a hand to Marion Fuller for uh, a very informative uh, presentation today. <laughs> Thanks.